Crime Scene. I am your host, Joe Hollywood, and once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew Lone Gunman Walker. The lone, (laughs) quote-unquote, lone gunman. I knew that was coming. There were no CIA agents on the ground at the time, we promise. So, it is uh, November 1st as we record this, and uh, this month, November 2023, marks the 60th anniversary of the assassination of JFK and uh it's uh there's going to be a lot of documentaries a lot of talk uh all the conspiracy theories everything are going to resurface this month and I sort of uh I, I hate to use the word celebrated but I uh I marked it. yeah I acknowledged the 60th anniversary by taking a, a long awaited trip uh to Dallas to visit Dealey Plaza, the Book Depository and some other locations we'll talk about in a second and it was an unforgettable experience. It was surreal um to be so familiar with an area that I had never stepped foot in before because of the documentaries and the films that have explored this topic time and time again. And so standing there looking around, recognizing pretty much every square inch was, was pretty amazing. Right. Um, so yeah, so I flew out on a Tuesday, but it was raining and, and, uh, the, the sixth floor museum at the book depository wasn't open yet. Uh, so it opened on Wednesday morning and the weather was a little nicer that day. So I got out there about an hour before the museum doors opened and just kind of started wandering around exploring Dealey Plaza. Uh, the Lyft driver dropped me off in front of the book depository and it took a second to kind of get my bearings straight. But once you realize Elm Street and the grassy knoll and all that comes into focus, you're kind of overwhelmed. Like, here it is. This is it. Sure. And oddly, there are some X's on the pavement of Elm Street that show where bullets were fired. There's the X uh, that's a little farther uh, on Elm Street that marks the, the kill shot, the head shot. But oddly, before that, there are two X's that are almost right on top of each other. And when I saw that, I was a little surprised um, because if you watch the movie JFK, which we'll talk more about a little bit later, they insist that there were two shots fired simultaneously, one from the back and one from the front. And I can't help but wonder if those X's in the pavement signified two simultaneous shots. It was a little little odd for me that they had that in the pavement. Um, But when you see those X's, you can picture everything that had happened, especially for those of you who've seen this Bruder film, you right. know, that was the definitive uh, evidence of what had transpired on Elm Street that day. Uh, of course, walking along Dealey Plaza, you can't help but come up on the grassy knoll. Uh, that's a term we've heard used over and over and over uh, of where some supposed shots came from the grassy knoll. There's a wooden fence area where some claim they saw puffs of smoke and flashes of light um, emitted from behind the wooden fence. So of course I had to go back behind the wooden fence and kind of look over Elm Street and there directly in front of me is the X in the pavement, the kill shot. And I, I thought to myself, this is a great vantage point if you want to take out the president and you know the motorcade's route there is a clear shot to the president from behind. Yeah. From behind the wooden fence. So that was kind of eerie. Uh, I also walked over, I looked around. Uh, there's another theory. I don't know if this is generally agreed upon by conspiracy theorists, but I know they address this on the X files. Uh, there's a storm drain down at the curb on Elm street. And the X files alluded to the fact that the cigarette smoking man, uh, who was Mulder's nemesis during the series, uh, fired the fatal shot from the uh, storm right. drain. Oh. And, uh, and of course, standing there again, clear line of sight, 
to the kill shot. Uh, so I had to take a picture of the storm drain, mostly because I'm an X-Files fan. Um, but that's yet another uh, theory out there that uh, they're, they say there was probably like, what, eight pairs of gunmen? That's what the conspiracy theorists claim. Eight? Yeah, there wow. was as many as like eight pairs of gunmen that were stationed on buildings and different locations around Dealey Plaza, behind the fence, the possible uh, storm sewer, of course, the book depository. That seems like a lot. That seems like a shooting I know. gallery. <laughs> but they, they use the term, especially in the movie JFK, triangulate. Sure. They wanted... Uh, shooters in at least three different points all aimed to, to at, make to make sure it happened. exactly yeah. yeah yeah so so that's a theory that there were multiple shooters because uh, here's one of the things that they ad- address on jfk and you can't help but wonder when i was up at the sixth floor museum looking down over elm street you can't help but wonder this that the limousine the uh, kennedy limo came up uh the one street i forget what the name of the street is and it was driving toward the book depository. Yes. Why not fire your weapon as the car is getting closer and closer and closer to you? That's the ideal shot. And then it makes the left turn onto Elm Street. And as it's moving away from the book depository, that's where supposedly Oswald took his shots. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No. Now, here's something that's interesting. I saw a documentary years ago and... In, in the days immediately after the assassination, somebody had a, a film camera up in the window of the book depository, the sixth floor, and they kind of followed an imaginary limo down the street and turning onto Elm Street. And some people theorized that the first shot was taken when the limousine was almost directly underneath the book depository. Um, and as the camera kind of followed the path, there's a street light that hangs right over Elm Street. And if you pause that film that was shot back in 63, there's a hole in the covering of the lens of one of the, you know, the red, yellow, green. There's a hole in there. And some people theorize that as Oswald tracked the limo, his first shot hit the street light and ricocheted. Uh, there's a there was a, a bystander who claims he got hit with uh, debris. James Tate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that was from the first shot or a later shot, um, but that that film, which o- was only like recently noticed, uh, shows that the first shot might have been taken when Kennedy was almost directly underneath Oswald. So let's say he fires the first shot, ricochets off the uh, the street light. Uh, fires the second shot, which hits Kennedy in the back and supposedly also hits Connolly, who's sitting in the jump seat of the limo. Uh, he, he cocks the gun again, carefully aims for the third shot, and then delivers the headshot uh, to Kennedy on Elm Street. So that's, that's the, the agreed-upon series of events uh, that happen. And uh, the, at the book depository, you can buy admission uh, to get a tour, which you don't get to explore the entire building because I would have loved to have seen the break room and some of the other areas right. that are connected to Oswald because that's a big part of the this, this story that day. Um, but you do go up to the sixth floor where it is set up as a museum. There's some amazing artifacts on display. Um, but even though the sniper's nest, which is recreated under glass there with the boxes and all this stuff you really don't have access to the sniper's nest but there's a window right next to oswald's window and as you look out that window you see elm street directly below you and you could imagine what was going through oswald's head um, as he fired his shots it was really eerie and there's a, a computer display a little tv monitor by each window and when you hit play it does a computer animation of the car coming around the corner and moving up Elm Street and when the shots were supposedly fired. Um, so it was very, very eerie to be up in the uh, sixth floor of that building. It's something I'd always visualized in my brain, and now here I was standing here looking out this window at the street below me. Um, one thing, uh, a big error from the movie JFK is one thing they really dwelled on was the tree, because when you're looking out the window, of the book depository, uh, there's a large tree that sort of blocks part of Elm Street. And uh, in the movie JFK, which is only set like, 
I think a, a year or two after the assassination, um, they say, well, Oswald was, was shielded by this tree. How could he have fired through this tree? In reality, when you look at movies from that time period, that tree was nowhere near that large in 1963. So that was a huge glaring error in the movie JFK, uh, that that tree did not obscure Oswald. He had a clear line of sight the entire way. Um, now when you look out, you see this big tree, but that was not the case back right. then. So um, other artifacts that were on display uh, was Oswald's wedding ring. Uh, the story goes that uh, that Thursday night uh, before the, uh, the assassination took place on Friday, that Thursday night he went to the Ruth Payne house. We'll get into more detail about this in a moment. But supposedly he left his wedding ring and some cash for Marina, which was basically him saying goodbye. You're probably not going to see me again. And uh, Marina discovered the ring. I think it was in a teacup or something. Uh she kept it for a while and then she just wanted to get rid of it. So somehow it wound up at the book depository. And it was amazing to see that on display uh, at the museum. Uh, there was a, a row of cameras. Uh, most of them were the genuine cameras that were used to document the events of that day. Okay. They were all lined up and every single one of them had the name of the person who had taken the photo or shot the film uh, who had donated the camera to the museum. So there, there had to have been about right. eight or 10 different cameras. Now, the the one camera that really stands out is the Zapruder camera. Now, the actual camera uh, is not at the book depository. They do have a replica. Um, the actual camera is at the National Archives, and I don't think it's on public display. But I did bring a little surprise for you guys today. All right. Yeah. All right. Look I at brought this. my Zapruder camera. Look at right. that. Bell and Howell Director Series. This is an exact duplicate of the Zapruder camera. It's got some weight to it. It is. I like it's heavy. That. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it hold is. that uh, hold that viewfinder up to your eye and you'll get yeah. an idea of what he was looking through as he was trying to track the limousine. It seems like it would be very challenging. Yes, it, it would. Do you have actual fil film in here? No, I don't have film in it. Uh, it takes this particular version takes a cartridge. I'm not sure if Zapruder used a cartridge or if it was a reel of film. Um, yeah. Yeah, very yeah. good. And I'll say that is a good five pounds, if yeah. not. <laughs> it is. I would say it's a good that five is pounds. Hefty. So I brought this with me. So this this camera has visited Dealey Plaza. I stood right where Zapruder stood holding this camera. So now this is part of history. And there were some uh, tourists there who asked to see it and look through it, and they took pictures of it. So You didn't get someone going like, are, are you Abraham Zapruder? <laughs> well, I wore the glasses and everything. So somebody uh, <laughs> somebody driving by quickly might go, is, is that the ghost of Zapruder up there? <laughs> Um, so it was really cool to stand where right. Zapruder stood. Um, but like I said, unfortunately, they have a replica like this uh, at the museum because uh, not only is the camera at the National Archives, but Oswald's rifle and pistol are at the National Archives, too. The shots were taken from uh, the southeast corner window where they have the sniper's nest set up. Uh, and the rifle was found in the northwest corner of the sixth floor. So... Um, it was hidden in some boxes and uh, quickly became evidence, and they supposedly found palm prints and everything on there that matched Oswald. Um, the shell casings, there were three shell casings found on the floor by the sniper, uh, by the window where the sniper took the shots. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, the museum does not have the actual rifle, but they did have a replica on display uh, I believe where it was found in the opposite corner of the building. I, I was just reading uh, briefly that one of the police officers who were first uh, arrived on the scene said that he found a Mauser. A Mauser? And, yeah, a different rifle. And he mm. did not find a, yeah, and he wrote a sworn affidavit that. Interesting. Remember seeing Mauser imprinted on the uh, rifle. So may, was there more than one rifle or was there, fab, you know, fabrication? Yeah. Did people, did the, uh, the higher ups uh, screw with some evidence there? I don't know. Some people claim that when they saw the police posing with the weapon, some say that at some points 
the strap, like the shoulder strap, yeah. was screwed into the the bottom of the butt, and then other shots showed the strap mounted to the side of the butt of the rifle. So some people are like, "Well, that changed from shot to shot." That I don't know about up. that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's that famous photo of Oswald. Where he, why he would take a photo of himself holding the rifle and yeah. some communist propaganda. Uh, a lot of people claim that photo was fake to put Oswald's face in possession of the gun. Uh, JFK went into great detail to show somebody cutting and pasting Oswald's face onto the body of someone holding the weapon. And also, I read that there were people heard more than three shots. Yeah. And and apparently Oswald only shot three times. So right, how do you explain yeah, those that other shots? that did come into come into play. So I I take, <laughs> I, I take the uh, we were talking before we went on air. I take the approach, and I was telling you guys this that I go with Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated President Kennedy. We can get into motivations later, but that's the accepted fact from the Warren report. Yeah, that's the conclusion. Right, yeah. that's the conclusion. So. Convince me otherwise. Introduce reasonable doubt based on evidence, not I heard someone say, I heard someone say. Because what happens with I heard someone say, no matter how good they are, is testimony gets changed over years. Yeah. People's memories change. People's memories forget. So you have to have some doc. At least a, people's memories you can call, because if you're trying to ask them what they said then and what they said now, you have two different points. You have no documentation. If you documented something that was said there, you have a fixed anchor point. And then when I talk to them later on, okay, then at least they can say, hey, you said this back in 63, 65, 70. This is now 1990-something, 2000-something. What are you saying here? What's going on? Yeah. So then we can work with something instead of just, oh, you know, I think I remember this thing. Oh, I think I remember this thing. Mm -hmm. Now, something to take into consideration when you hear people say, oh, there were more shots and shots came from here. There are, there's a thing called echoes that yes. happen around high rises and tall buildings. So you got to factor in the fact that maybe, maybe a shot came from here, but echoed over here. And that caused people to look in different directions. You, you got to take that into consideration. I'm not saying it, no, it no. happened and or you, didn't happen, but those are things you need to consider. And absolutely. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're not being honest. Right. As you're going on the conspiracy side, that it was not just Lee Harvey Oswald, then you're not being an honest broker in the yeah. conversation. And that's something I'm always willing to do. Like, I, I form my conclusion based on my own research, but I'm always open to new evidence. And, you know, I've read uh, statements that people saw a flash of light and a muzzle, yes. uh, muzzle flash and smoke come from behind the wooden fence. And I take all that into consideration. What did they see? I don't know. Um, Here, here's one snippet. In 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that there were four shots. One coming from the grassy knoll. So that's from the hmm. House Select Committee. Yeah. So wow. Interesting. So, just something to yeah. take into consideration if, if our own government is admitting. Yeah. And why so, wasn't that pursued more? Like, why yeah. why wasn't that more fully explored during the, the Warren Commission? Yeah. I don't know. I, well, that I, I know why, but no, I'm joking. <laughs> So following, uh, following the School Book Depository in, in Dealey Plaza, I had read earlier that the what was formerly known as the Dallas Police Headquarters was just a few blocks away, less than a mile right. uh, from Dealey Plaza. So I walked over to the Dallas Police Headquarters, which is now the uh, UNT Dallas College of Law. Now, I was under the impression that it was open as a museum, and I was... Uh, disappointed to find out that currently it's only open to law students, that the public can't just walk in. Uh, they're talking about changing that. They may m make certain portions of it available to the Is public. Is it a publicly funded uh, university? Uh, I'm not sure, but when I tried to get in, there was really heavy security at the entrance, and they said that there's still a functioning court that uh, – uh, operates out of that building and so that's why security is really sure. high with metal detectors and everything so for safety reasons they can't just let somebody walk in so um hopefully that will change at some point sure. um so what i was limited to was standing outside the building i found the entrance where when you look at historical uh, film and photos there was a, a large armored vehicle 
parked in this Bay Area with the big roll-up door waiting to transport Oswald from the Dallas Police Headquarters to County Jail. And as he was being transported, that's where Jack Ruby stepped in and silenced Oswald uh, right in that uh, basement level of Dallas Police Headquarters. So at least I could say I saw that entrance way and from what i understand it everything is pretty much the same as it was in 1963 wow. uh, i yeah. hope someday to be able to go inside there and explore that um so that was my second stop after dealey plaza i went there um so then i tried to figure out my next move and i pulled out google i started googling and i found out the next closest location uh, was the texas theater so i uh i couldn't walk to it it was it was a little bit of a walk, so I uh, did a lift, uh, uh, ordered a lift uh, drive, uh, ride. And this is a little bit of a weird coincidence because as I'm sitting on the steps of the of the uh, Dallas Police Headquarters, I placed my order for the lift, and it said the pickup spot is the Dallas Morning News Building. So I looked around, and kitty corner from where I was sitting was the Dallas Morning News. So I went over there to wait for my lift driver. Well, later on, I found out that that's where Jack Ruby was when he learned of the assassination. He was placing an ad in the Dallas Morning News for oh, his oh, club. So, so it's the same building six uh, years as later. As far as I know, uh, it's the same, same building. News, yeah. Like our free press or yeah. Detroit News. It wow. still said Dallas Morning News on the building, and it was a sheer coincidence that Lyft had that as my pickup location. Otherwise, I would have never noticed it. Yeah, And cool. sure enough... That was another connection to history was that that's where Jack Ruby was when he learned of the assassination. It happened while he was in the advertising office. That, that's, that was kind of cool when I learned that. So my Lyft driver picked me up, took me over to the Texas Theater on uh, Jefferson Street, and that is where uh, Oswald was apprehended. Uh, the way the story goes, there was a shoe salesman. He had a store on Jefferson Street. He saw a shady looking character kind of looking nervous and kind of ducking uh, by the entrance and then looking around and then moving. It was enough to draw the attention of the, the shoe store owner to follow him a little bit. And he saw him duck into the Texas theater without buying a ticket. So the shoe store owner notified the girl working in the ticket booth and said, hey, some guy just snuck into your theater. And he was suspicious enough where the ticket taker called the police and that's when all the police like showed up at the theater and uh this is in the wake of him supposedly f killing officer Tippett, which we'll talk about in a second i forgot about that yeah yeah, yeah. so that's that. part of his yeah. movements okay. um so the texas theater is where he was apprehended supposedly he pulled a gun on the police officers trying to arrest him and the one policeman testified that the only reason Oswald didn't shoot him dead is when Oswald pulled the gun and the cop reached for it, the webbing between his index finger and his thumb caught the hammer of the gun as it came down Whoa. and caught him right on the webbing <laughs> and kept him from getting shot point blank in the in the chest. Wow. And so, of course, Yikes. punches flew, and that's where Oswald got the black eye and all that stuff. And, wow. you know, despite trying to fire the gun at the police officers, he claimed that he was a patsy and blah, 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 blah. Um, so that's where he got arrested. Uh, so... The theater, the Texas Theater, is a working movie theater. They, as a matter of fact, from what I read, uh, money that they got from the filming of JFK, the movie, helped keep the theater alive, and it still huh. functions to this day. I wonder if they have the seat Oswald they sat said, here. That was my one uh, disappointment. Wow. I, I almost, I have reason to want to go back to Dallas now because I was there on a Wednesday and it wasn't open to the public on Wednesday, but it, it, it showed movies. I apparently like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever. Um, so I wasn't able to get inside the theater, but, uh, it sounds like everything is still the same as it was back in 63. So it was kind of neat to stand there and imagine everything that happened there. So after, um, uh, taking some pictures of the Texas theater, uh, the next place that I went to, and this was the highlight of my trip, uh, was the rooming house that Oswald lived at when he assassinated the president. Um, now, I wasn't aware of the fact that the house was part of a tour that you bought 
tickets to. And I just I knocked on the door of the rooming house and walked in and <laughs> caught the tail end of a tour that happened to be going on. And it was actually pretty comical because the guy who was leading that tour, I guess he does it on a regular basis. And the woman who currently owns the rooming house, who is the descendant of the grandmother or her grandmother who owned the rooming house when Oswald lived there, she's giving the tour. She's kind of giving her opinion. And she described Oswald as a patriot. Uh, He was a nice boy. He loved his country. Well, then the tour guide lost his mind and <laughs> kind of got into a, a, a playful argument with, uh, with uh, her name was uh, Patricia Hall. And he's like, he tried to defect to the Soviet Union. And, and she's like, well, I, he is a nice boy. And so it was kind of funny catching that. And so the tour ends, they leave. Patricia Hall comes up to me. She says, how can I help you? And I said, I'm sorry. I don't know how this works. I just wanted to see the rooming house. And she said, well, it just so happens I have about two hours to kill. And I'm like, okay. So she's like, I have trouble standing, so let's go sit down. So I sit on the sofa. She sits in a chair across from me. There's an old console TV and stuff. And there's magazines and newspapers everywhere. And I said, so how much of this is original? And she's like, it's all original. Wow. She said, the only difference, the couch that I was sitting on has since been reupholstered, but it's the same couch. Everything's the same. All the furnishings are the same. They kept it in the family from the grandmother to the mother to the daughter. And um, now it operates as sort of a museum because right. it's, it's, I think it's on the uh, Register of Historic Places. And, uh, and she invites people to come in and she shows them the house. So I said, well... Where did Oswald sleep? And she gets up, takes me over to this little tiny room with a bed in it. And she goes, this is Oswald's bed. This is the bed he slept in. And there is an armoire on the other side of the door. That's where he came in, grabbed his jacket, grabbed his revolver and left after the assassination. For the theater. Uh, not for the, the- well, uh, yeah, yeah. It was after the assassination, but before he got arrested at the theater, he stopped in, put on a jacket, grabbed his re- revolver. And this was all witnessed by the housekeeper, um, who said, did you hear the president got shot? And he didn't really respond and hurriedly grabbed his jacket and left. Um, and so we went back, we sat down. Uh, like I said, I, I felt like I was time traveling. Like I'm in Oswald's house. And she's like, do you want to hear my conspiracy theories? And I said, no, not really. (laughs) I said, I want to hear your memories. I want to hear your story. So she said, I said, how old were you when when the assassination took place? She said she was 11 years old. And I said, what are your memories of Oswald? Did you visit this rooming house? She said constantly. Her and her two brothers would stay at the rooming house, you know, like if their mother was doing something, they would hang out at grandma's rooming house. They called him Mr. Lee. Uh, when she would sit at the dining room table and do her homework, Mr. Lee would come over, try to help her with her homework. But he struggled with the homework as much as she did as an 11-year-old, she said. Um, and then uh, one day when her two brothers were roughhousing on the front lawn, things got a little heated. Oswald was sitting on the front porch. He went up, broke up the fight separated the two, said, you two are brothers. You need to get along. You need to love each other, and broke up the fight on the front lawn. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he had lived there about seven weeks prior uh, to the... So seven weeks prior to the assassination, he lived there right up through the assassination. Okay. And so she has these memories of Oswald being kind and gentle and trying to help where he could. Um when the, when the grandmother said, hey, there's a, another room in a different boarding house that's available, he's like, no, this, this is good enough for me, that little tiny room with the bed. And uh, on the wall was a kind of a shadow box that had um, high-resolution scans of all of his documents and IDs and everything. That was really fascinating to see. And a replica of his thirty-eight revolver was in that shadow box. Um, So to sit there with this woman who personally knew Lee and was old enough to have vivid memories of him, and here I am sitting on the couch in the living room of this home 
was the highlight of the trip for me. Um, it was just amazing to hear those personal stories. And I wish I, I had a recorder. I wish right. I had a camera. I wish I had something uh, to hear her uh, tell those stories. It was Maybe just on the amazing. return trip. I know. I'm, I have lots of reasons to go back. Um, so that was the highlight. And so then after that, I thought, what's next? And I did some more Googling and up came the Ruth Payne house. And so I grabbed another lift and gave, uh, you know, put in the address that I wanted to go to. And uh, I can't remember if it was this lift driver or the previous lift driver, but when I brought up what I was doing and I, I said, oh, I'm doing my own, you know, makeshift JFK t uh, tour, the old guy driving the vehicle turned to me and said, I saw the motorcade that day. I saw Kennedy go by me and I was like, Whoa, the lift driver is now part of the experience. That was pretty amazing. And he, he claimed that I think he said his brother knew Oswald and was like friends with Oswald. And I'm like, this is awesome. Now, how much, uh, how, how many of these people do you think are, are uh, pulling your chain? You know, well, it's, just, it just, all just, happened just, there. So I would imagine the locals <laughs> all have some connection, you know, it's kind of like Hoffa. Like Hoffa lived here in Lake Orion, and you right. could run into many, many people right over there. who remember <laughs> him, who drank with him, who yeah. boated with him. So yep. when you're when you're local, you're going to run into a lot of people who had encounters with him. And 60 years ago, yeah, it was a long time ago. Or but at least like a tertiary connection. Like, yeah, yeah he some, came in, uh, yeah. even if it's a transient thing, like, oh, he came in on one Saturday. He yeah. actually spilled the eggs on the floor, and I'm the one that cleaned it up. And yeah, exactly. That, and they all their have their, their stories, yeah. Wrong. So... So I, I punch in the address to the Ruth Payne house. The Lyft driver takes me to a like creative arts museum. <coughs> Not really a museum, but a center. And I was confused. I'm like, I think you dropped me off at the wrong place. He said, well, this is the address that came up, and it says Ruth Payne house. So I get out of the lift. I walk around outside. Then I go inside the center. It's pretty much empty. I see a gift shop. There's a couple of women working at the gift shop. I go in, I'm like, am I in the right place? And they, they said, yeah, this is where tours of the Ruth Payne house meet here. And then they take a shuttle over to the house, which is like a mile away. And I'm like, oh, so I'm kind of in the wrong place. And I said, is there any more tours left? And they said, no, nope, you missed the last one. Oh, and no. I was like, ah, so the woman says, hold on a second. She gets on the phone. She talks to someone. She hangs up the phone. She says, you're in luck. She said, the guy who does the Ruth Payne house tours is there now with one guy and they'll, they'll wait for you to, to get there. So I ordered another lift. These lifts were starting to get expensive after a while. Yeah. And we made a beeline to the Ruth Payne house, jumped out, met the tour guide on the porch. He kind of gave me a little update. We went inside the house again. Everything was either original or period accurate. They used photos to try and place everything where it needed to be right uh he showed me so the ruth Payne house for those of you who aren't that familiar with ruth Payne, uh the oswalds who had lived on neely street that's where he posed that for that fo famous for photo with the of, rifle yep. uh he started traveling a lot lee was going to uh mexico city and new orleans and they had met uh ruth and michael Payne at a a Russian get together and Ruth had been studying the Russian language. So her husband said, this might be an opportunity for you to use your Russian language with real Russians. So they went to this get together. Uh, Ruth said that she met Lee first and was not impressed. Uh, he just wanted to talk politics and push his politics on her. So she made an excuse to get away from Lee, but then she met Marina and just adored Marina and they had a conversation. They had a connection and so when Lee started traveling a lot, Ruth said, look, you have a, a daughter, because uh, they had a daughter in Russia where he met Marina, and a second one was on the way. So, uh, so Ruth invited Marina and the, the daughter to live in her house. Um, at this point, Ruth and her husband, Michael, had separated. So it was just Ruth, Marina, uh, the first daughter, and then later the second uh, daughter was born. And so Lee was traveling. Marina stayed with Ruth. Um, the story goes that on Thursday, November 21st, Lee kind of surprised everyone by showing up because normally, even though he was living in the rooming house, 
he would visit Marina and the daughter uh, on like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then go back to work on Monday. And he showed up on a Thursday. What they theorize is that he kept the rifle at in the garage of the Ruth Payne house. So he came back on Thursday, uh, collected the rifle, wrapped it in paper, like brown paper. And then on Friday morning, November 22nd, he walked a few doors down uh, to a neighbor that he worked with at the book depository and asked for a ride in that morning. And I think he's the one who told Ruth about the job at the book depository. Yeah, on the day of the assassination, Oswald asked co-worker Wesley Frazier for a ride to work. He lived a few doors down. And the tour guide pointed out his house and said that Oswald knocked on the window uh, in the kitchen and the wife answered and said, yeah, he could be all right. Um, so that's the connection to the Ruth Payne house. After the assassination, the uh, the law enforcement FBI descended on the house, grilled Marina and Ruth, and they told them what they knew. So that was the connection to that part of the story was the Ruth Payne house. Um, and so that was, uh, that was pretty much it. That was my tour, uh, my, that I just sort of winged on my own, uh, in one day going from place to place to place, hitting those key locations. Very I, nice. I did want to visit the house where he posed with the rifle, but I was told that's privately owned. And even though I don't think anyone's currently occupying the house, they said to try and recreate that photo photo, you have to climb through a hole in the fence. And I'm like, mm, I don't, no one's I don't know if I need to do that right is. now. And also another location that I thought about visiting was the intersection where Oswald killed uh, police officer J.D. Tippett. Um, but I wasn't familiar with the neighborhood, and I wasn't sure if I should be walking around like a tourist asking people, hey, where's that intersection? So I, I'll save that for another time. Right. But um, the trip was amazing. It was really memorable. I, I learned a lot, met a lot of interesting people just, you know, fellow enthusiasts. And we shared our opinions and theories and experiences. And I showed people the Zapruder camera and all that stuff. And uh, it was an unforgettable experience. And if you're a history buff, uh, I really, really recommend uh, doing it. And uh, make sure you include uh, uh, Patricia Hall's uh, rooming house. Because Absolutely. It's, it's, it's so well preserved it's it's really amazing and she sounds like a delightful woman yeah <laughs> and and the interesting thing is she's she's very pro conspiracy very protective of oswald and some of the things that she told me started planting that seed of doubt in my head like maybe he didn't do it <laughs> you know because no. you're talking like you're getting a first hand eyewitness account of what happened uh, at that time and oh, a little little side note that uh, she told me um, when when I asked her how old she was when the assassination took place she told me she was 11 and uh, she said she was at home with her mother and brothers not at the the boarding house but at her own home and they noticed that their mother had unplugged the TV and said whoops the TV's broken and they're like wow oh, we saw you unplug it well, she was trying to protect him from all the news coverage of the day. About Oswald. Well, uh, oh, mostly about, about the killing the, of the, right, president. the president. Right. So a couple of days go by. The mom decides to plug the TV back in. The kids are watching TV on the floor, and they're like, we interrupt this program with a special news bulletin. They are transferring uh, suspect Lee Harvey Oswald. And the kids turn to the mom and said, Mr. Lee's on TV. <laughs> and guess what happened next? Yes. They witnessed his murder mm. on live television. Here the mother was trying to protect the kids from all the Jeez. details of the story, and they witnessed Mr. Lee get gunned down on live television. That's that's pretty crazy. That's yeah. that's wild. So so that's my trip. Uh, Actually, in a, a quick nutshell. question. Did they do you guys ever know whatever happened to Oswald's children who in like the daughter and then the ch second one that was on the way. Did yeah. they ever, ever do a follow-up? I do know. So, well, sort of. So I asked the tour guide when I was at the Ruth Payne house, I said, what happened to Marina and the children? And to my shock, the tour guide said, Marina still lives here in Dallas. Whoa. And I'm like, no. About a year <laughs> after the assassination, she remarried because now she's a widow with no source of income. And uh, she remarried. Uh, had a child by her new husband, 
all the children took the new husband's name so they wouldn't have to go through life with right. the last name sure, Oswald. Sure, sure, sure. Imagine, you know, going to a bar or whatever, and they're like, there's that Oswald yeah. kid. Um, so apparently they lived fairly normal lives after that. And yeah, because I've never heard anything yeah. Any about that. Follow up Hopefully on them. she can keep at least some sort of an- anonymity, but she's got to be probably in her 80s. 80, she's 81 yeah. or 82 because someone snapped a photo of her 10 years ago when she was like 71 coming out of a grocery store. <laughs> and I'm like, imagine living in that area and you're looking over at the woman next have, to you. Going, do you think she has adult grandchildren at this point? Probably, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would imagine yeah. that, yeah. yeah. And they, and so if they were in, she told like your grandfather shot President Kennedy. Yeah. I'm sure they have to be aware of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, interestingly, yeah. the tour guide told me that Marina actually took part in, like, assassination anniversary events early on, um, but th- and maybe they paid her an amount that she couldn't say no to, but eventually it got so crazy that she, she became pretty much a recluse. Right. And I had read that they have her and her current husband have a sign on the lawn that says, keep out, go away, that sort of thing. Yeah. So she doesn't speak of it now, and, and she's probably going to take any. But it's, a, it's a general keep out. Like they don't put yeah. any. Because then the sign could attract people like, there she is. Yeah, yeah. How do you, how do you identify the house? Look for the big keep out sign. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it shocked me. Like I had, I had read years ago that she was still alive but when okay. he when he was i thought she was like living in russia or something and when he said no she's she's a dallas resident just living her life and going grocery shopping i'm like that's crazy to me i can't believe it that she's still just living a life in dallas that's wild so so yeah that's what happened to marina in the children wow yeah, yeah. fair enough so all right so that brings us up to our theories um you know, there are theories that uh, Jack Ruby uh, was uh, assigned basically to silence Oswald, who, you know, was claiming he was a patsy, and I'm sure he would have named names if that was true. And uh, supposedly Jack Ruby had mob connections and uh, was given the task of silencing him, even though Ruby maintained until his death that he acted alone. Um, for those of you who are wondering what happened to Jack Ruby, uh, he was tried and convicted and was sentenced to death at one point. Uh, his lawyers argued for a retrial, which they had granted. Um, but before he can have the retrial trial, he was diagnosed with cancer and he died on January 3rd, 1967. So four years after the assassination, uh, claiming that he had acted alone. Now, oh. The movie, I just watched a movie the other day called Ruby, which came out just a few years after JFK. And I think it was, it might've been hurt by the fact that JFK sort of overshadowed the movie. Um, But I watched it and I I was impressed with the performances. Danny Aiello played Jack Ruby and he's, you know, Danny Aiello, he's great in everything he does. Um, And uh, what's her name? Uh, Sherilyn Fenn. Uh, was in it. She was stunning with blonde hair, but I found out she plays a fictional character uh, who goes by the the stripper name of Candy Kane, um, and that really kind of put a sour taste in my mouth. Like, okay, you're you're trying to recreate the facts of this historical event, and you you create a fictional character who plays a central role in this movie. Um, one interesting little side note is uh, when Candy Kane is dancing at Ruby's Carousel Club, uh, you know, he was very friendly to police officers. And so they depicted all the officers on law enforcement night, all hooting and hollering. And the camera cuts to a young David Duchovny uh, sitting in the crowd, and he developed sort of an infatuation with this Candy Kane. Well, when I looked up uh, Ruby on IMDb and scrolled down to David Duchovny's name, you know what character he was playing? Officer J.D. Tippett. Oh. oh. <laughs> that kind of surprised okay. me. So they're insinuating that Tippett had a connection to Ruby and was a frequent guest at the Carousel Club. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know if that's true or not, but that seems to be a bit Could of be a be one stretch. of those Hollywood liberties. 
So, yeah, uh, Ruby, the movie goes into this rabbit hole saying that Ruby was not only connected to the mob, but to the CIA, and he was doing their bidding and blah, 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 blah. And I had a really hard time swallowing that. Ruby, who was from Chicago, I, I can't imagine him having a bigger role in all this. I, again, and I'll get your guys' opinion. To me, Ruby was a Dallas business owner. Yeah, he may have been shady. They say he would rough up customers and stuff. But witnesses said that he was genuinely heartbroken when Kennedy was assassinated. He he felt for Jackie and, and uh, their children. And he says that when he saw Oswald's smug look on his face, yeah, I remember that I read, just pushed him over the edge. I read that, yeah. Now, here's this is interesting. Um, let me find this. So people say, oh, well, you know, he was hired to silence uh, Oswald. But get this. So on November 24th, which I believe was the Sunday after the assassination, this guy, now I want you to imagine, okay, let's say he was told he had to take out Oswald. On November 24th, he drove with his little dachshund, Sheba, to send a money order at the Wells Fargo office, which was just down the street from Dallas police headquarters. Uh, one of his employees had requested money. So he went and sent her, uh, wired her money. The timestamp on the transaction was 1117. Oswald was shot at 1121. Now a man who was planning on killing Oswald, why would you be at the Wells Fargo office four minutes before you're supposed to pull the trigger. And the interesting thing is, is that the transfer of Oswald was delayed. He was supposed to be transferred earlier. Yeah. So Ruby would have missed the whole thing. Now all the police officers knew Ruby because of his club and everything. He walked in unnoticed, stood there to watch, you know, you know what's going on. They're like, Oh, they're about ready to transfer Oswald. Immediately Oswald walks by Ruby always carried his little 38 revolver, saw that look on Oswald's face, acted on an impulse, pulled the gun and killed him. And everyone said, oh, he was there to silence him. The, the facts don't line up. It, it doesn't add up. You don't walk in four minutes before the transfer to, to do something you were hired to do. What are your thoughts on, let's, let's start with that. What are your thoughts on Ruby? What was Ruby's role in all this? Well, the interesting thing is, Andrew mentioned the HSCA, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, that was formed after the Zapruder film was made public. We saw that in, on Geraldo Rivera's show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, because the outcry, because that was the first time it was publicly viewed, the outcry forced the HSCA to be created, and it had a budget, and it was it went on from 1976 to 79. And the findings that it did after it re-interviewed uh, uh, witnesses and re-examined testimony and re-examined evidence was that they found that there were problems with the Warren Commission report. And so they said that we need to look into it. Now, the church committee, Frank Church was investigating because of Watergate, and he was investigating specifically the FBI and CIA because they had screwed up royally. Yep. And he says, what, what else have you guys screwed up on? Oh, we have this thing that you were supposed to be investigating on that you were cited as the lead investigators on for the Warren Commission. So he opens up, that investigation leads to Senator Schweiker and Gary Hart. Gary Hart famously gets caught later on, but that's a different topic for <laughs> something another else. another podcast. Right, so they investigate, and they found that the Warren Commission uh, had obviously issues. They were looking for the purpose of finding conflicts and conspiracies and cover-ups. Schweiker found that Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, the, who's the director of the FBI, admitted that the FBI had a relationship with Jack Ruby, the man who obviously shot Oswald, and that he was a confidential informant. Yeah. That's okay. the documented because thing. Because of that. his connection to organized crime and right. all that yep. stuff, yeah. And that was left out of the Warren Commission report mm -hmm. when it was initially done because it was deemed classified. Schwerker and, Hart, uh, Schwerker and Hart then determined that the intelligence agencies did all the wrong things if they were looking for a conspiracy as to who killed JFK. But the momentum stalled in the 60s because the Vietnam War was picking up, yep. the civil rights movement was picking yep. up, the space race, and there was all sorts of other things that kind of, so it kind of went by the way, wayside until 12 years later, Zabruder film, 
Mm-hmm. The public seeing the film caused an outcry that forced Congress to revisit the JFK investigation, creates the HSCA. It interviewed, like I said, witnesses re-examined evidence from the Warren Commission report and exposed major inconsistencies. Witnesses like Dr. Cyril Wetch, I think I believe, or Wecht, he was a forensic pathologist uh, on the and the panel that provided it for testimony in the HSCA, uh, along with Dr. Vincent Gruen, who argued about the magic bullet, and then Richardson Pryor, who was a committee member. They could not understand why the Pentagon had destroyed its JFK files. It that when the JFK investigation files at the end, the HSCA investigation found over five hundred thousand records Eesh. were to be remain sealed until twenty twenty nine. In those records, they talk about there were apparently more reports about Jack Ruby, but the the mob connection was saying, well, Hoover's like, well, yeah, that's why we had a connection with them, but it was the level of contact they had with them leading up to that time period when you were talking about, yeah, he has to go to Wells Fargo to send money to someone, and then he would have missed the time period. So when it comes to Jack Ruby, I don't deny that the man was passionate about JFK. I don't deny the man didn't like the smug, everything, because that's his testimony. He says that, so how can he refute it? Mm -hmm. Call him a liar, but he's gone. Yeah, yeah. So what are you going to do? That's the documented evidence. But the fact that if he's, it's very rare to be both a CIA and FBI they don't share. They don't like to share. Those two yeah. agencies do not get along. They don't yeah. play well, nice, nice together on, on, on many things, especially confidential informants. But he was a confidential informant to the FBI, and it was not, it withheld from the Warren report. Now, that's the, why would you not just put that in? Just say, yeah, okay, yeah, well, look, we investigate the mob. Jack Ruby has a club. You guys get it. Get it. It's not a big deal. It's when you start to hide things. Yeah. And say there's nothing here to look at. Then, okay, we got to put a little pin in that. Yeah, to to fit your narrative. So, like, yep. you know, they're trying to put together a, a sequence of events, and obviously they uncovered things that might challenge that. So, well, let's just set this over to yep. the side because that's ruining our narrative. Yep, exactly. Right. Like I said, everything else is true. I'm not, and that Did he have mob connections to the mob? Yes. Did, would, it, would he have been an asset into mob investigation? Absolutely. Why would the FBI not have it? Therefore, that justifies the contact. It's when the contact happened. When did why why was it why was he delayed? Guy like Lee Harvey Oswald, you don't delay that. Like, what's the big deal? There's the armor transport. Get him in. Get him out. Yeah. You know, half this country wants to kill this man. Yeah. They said the the when it was announced outside of the police station that Oswald had just been shot. They said the crowd erupted in cheers. So wow, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, and they they knew ahead of time that, and that might be the, the reason they were transferring him is that they knew Oswald's life was in danger. And if you go with things, he's he's such a friend of the cops. The cops are very much supposed to you know, protect. You know, don't let the mob just walk in and hang the guy like a lynch mob. Yeah, yeah. So they keep the course. So they are informed of any alternate pathways or any changed pathways. Ruby is a friend of all the cops. They're like Jack, you know, if you want to get a good view of it, just come by here. He could come by. <laughs> Even when he gets on and walks, he's like, oh, my late, did I miss it? Hey, Jack, come on over this way. <laughs> yeah. This is the best angle you can come on there. He knew exactly where to get stand. The guy showed up four minutes you know, before he was sending money, gets all the way to the front, like, pardon me, kid. Pardon yeah, me, people. Yeah. I want to see who's that. <laughs> They'll let Jack go right to the front of the line. Yeah. Now, it fits I'm, a narrative, though. I was talking to somebody about that four-minute window or whatever, and they said, well, since he was friendly to the cops, why couldn't someone at the ground level – Take a radio and say, "All right, you know, code name so and so is in position. Begin the transfer." And I'm like, oh, "That's such a tight window." I mean, I see what they're saying. Like maybe he was delayed because they were waiting for Ruby to get into place. I mean, but four minutes is plenty of time ooh, to do a lot of things. That's a stretch, but, but it calls into question why was the d- delay? I'm like, "Oh, we didn't process the paperwork. Paperwork on Oswald? Okay, yeah, that's the reason to not to shift the location. They shift the." The, the pathway he was supposed to go out a different entrance yeah so why did wow. he go out a different entrance why why'd they switch the to the side entrance yeah. that never made any sense yeah. so the interesting thing too is the armored car that he was supposed to get loaded up into became a problem when after he got shot because it was blocking the entrance when an ambulance was trying to get right. to oswald and and so they're 
they're like, move the armored car. And which that is, delay. Wow. You which know. is another thing because he got shot. It'll take an ambulance at least a couple of minutes to get there. Can someone get the keys and move it 10 <laughs> yards away? <laughs> Just go right or left. Pick a direction. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Just get out of the way so the ambulance can come in there. Yeah. You can't find the keys, boss. See, those are all the little things. That right. When you add it all up, that's what gives birth to all these conspiracy theories like, why this? Why the delay? Why this, this, this? And yeah. and it's, it's just a couple of things. I don't think we're even talking about this, but they just keep adding up and There's adding a, up. There's a lot. There's a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's uh, let's talk about Oswald. Uh, pretty, I guess you could argue he's the key figure in this. Uh, born in 1939, he joined the Marines at age 17. He was court-martialed twice. I read that one of the times he was court-martialed, he accidentally shot himself uh, <laughs> with, I think, a gun that he wasn't assigned by the Marines. See, that proves right there that he didn't <laughs> do it to Kennedy. He Captain could, he shot himself. <laughs> this is a crack shot. Um, and then, uh, you know, he tried to defect to the Soviet Union in 1959. That's where he met and married Marina, where they had the daughter together. Uh, he had convinced her that he had no plans on moving back to the U.S., but... He returned to the U.S. in 1962, uh, settled in Dallas. Why Dallas? Well, this is where his mother and brother lived. Uh, his brother has appeared on many, many documentaries saying, oh, yeah, Lee did it. Um, they had a second daughter a month before the assassination. That's when uh, she was at the Ruth Payne house. Uh, in March of 1963, he bought the mail order Carcano rifle for twenty nine ninety five, and I guess he bought his pistol mail order too. And that's another weird red flag: is they're yeah. like it's Dallas, Texas. You could walk into a Seven yeah. Eleven and and yes. buy a rifle. Why why mail order and why leave a paper trail? Yeah. So that's another thing that you know conspiracy theorists point to. Um, now this is a big deal, and this wasn't discovered until after the assassination. Um, but based on a letter that Oswald had written to Marina on April 10th, 1963, Oswald attempted to shoot retired major general Edwin Walker through the, the, the big, uh, picture window of his home in Dallas. I've never um, heard that. Wow. Yeah. So the general's like sitting at a desk in front of this window, the window shatters. He was only hit with uh, fragments and survived the assassination attempt. And the police had no suspects until this letter was discovered that Marina had admitted uh, under questioning that she had hidden because it looked really, really bad. And so now all of a sudden uh, the police department had their suspect on the attempted assassination of the general um, who Oswald hated. Oswald hated him. Apparently he was a, uh, he was anti, uh, uh, or he was, I guess he was pro segregation. Is that what I'm? Saying? He wanted to keep everybody apart. Yes, yeah, so he was pro yeah, segregation. Yeah, pro, pro. yeah, so he was kind of a racist, and he 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 was kind of drummed out of the military because he was hand, handing out propaganda to his soldiers. Oh, so um, so Oswald hated his guts, and that supposedly was his motivation for trying to take him out. Um, so then let's see. So then he got the, the ride to work from his coworkers. Um, oh, he was living at the Dallas rooming house at the time on North Beckley while Marina was living with Ruth Payne. He would stay there on weekends on the day of the assassination. He got the ride into work who, um, he testified that, uh, Oswald was carrying a package wrapped in paper. Uh, when he left the Payne house, I mentioned earlier, he left his ring and $170 for Marina. Uh, goes into work witnesses uh placed oswald you know obviously in the building before and after uh the shots were fired but nobody saw him while the shots were being fired but here's some more fodder for conspiracy theories um about 90 seconds after the shooting uh, uh Oswald's supervisor, Roy Truly, was leading a Dallas police officer, Marion Baker, uh, through the building when the police officer drew his weapon on Oswald and said, who's this? And the supervisor said, he's one of our employees. Well, the police officer testified that Oswald stood there with like a Coke in his hand, not sweating, not breathing heavily, looking genuinely confused like what's going on <laughs> and it was enough for the officer to say okay let's go and left him behind in the break room 
showing no signs that he had done anything wrong. And other, other employees of the building said the same thing that he just was like, what's happening? What's going on? And at some point, if you believe in this sort of thing, when he realized what was happening, he walked out of the front door of the book depository before they had a chance to seal off the crime scene and made his way to his, his, uh, rooming house. Wow. Um, and so that's, you know, again, fodder for conspiracy theories. Right. Oh, uh, why, why would he just be sitting there in the break room drinking a Coke after he had just shot the president? Like it makes no sense. No. Nope. Um, and walked right out of the front entrance and no one looked twice because, uh, he was an employee there. Um, so he boarded a bus, uh, but because of traffic and everything, he got off two blocks later, he held a cab, uh, which took him to the rooming house where he was witnessed by housekeeper Erlene Roberts, where he grabbed his jacket and, uh, apparently his revolver. I don't think she witnessed him grabbing a revolver, but she did say he left in a different jacket that he had come in with. And then approximately 1.15 uh, p.m., uh, that's when he encountered J.D. Tippett, who rolled up alongside of Oswald because they said be on a lookout of this suspicious subject. And Tippett talked to Oswald through the passenger window of the police car. And after exchanging words, as Tippett got out of the car, Oswald pulled his revolver and fired four shots, killing Tippett. Uh, they found the shell casings nearby which they say matched Oswald's um, revolver, but they said the bullets that were retrieved from Tippett's body had no conclusive proof that it came from the gun because they claim that they were too badly damaged to get any useful information from. But again, yet another thing that conspiracy no, theorists can use. Why were they not able to definitively say these bullets came from Oswald's it's gun? It's never so. one definitive thing. It's, it's, a, it's, the, it's like a death by a thousand pinpricks. That usually what happens on this thing. Yep. Yeah. My one point, and we were talking about documentaries that there's so many that came out. I look at there's one coming out uh, by on Paramount Plus called I believe I have it here. It's the JFK What the Doctors Saw. It's coming out on November 14th mm. of this month, 2023, and it follows the seven Parkland do doctors at Parkland Hospital and what they and their reports and how they were concerned that the autopsy when the body left trauma room one. And the autopsy reports that are being revealed. They said that's not what we wrote. That's not what we we filed. And they never said anything about it until it was all in the de uh, documents that were declassified that came out. And I think Stone had a secondary a follow up because he'd seen the the reports like, "Hey, you were shot at a tree incidents." He said, "Hey, you, these are the valid criticisms of your your film JFK. Do you care to address it?" And so he said, okay, I had to sit down and work on this. And then it came down to the National Archives of Maryland, all the stuff that was declassified by the AARB after the first JFK film that came out. They were given a four-year window to declassify as many documents as you can, and the public can then view it. They can uh, investigate it, they can publish it, and they can uh, investigate it. Mm -hmm. And so these are on uh, Maryland right now. So because of that JFK film, which caused that awkward people were like, oh, maybe it was a conspiracy because the Justice Department was supposed to investigate it and they never did. So this is, so when the AR, AARB came out and then they launched their investigation, they declassified more than 2 million pages and artifacts Jeez. that were housed there. And one of them that came into contact was the magic bullet theory. The magic bullet theory apparently was invented the first time it ever came into the Warren Report was by Arlen Specter, who was a senator. Right? Well, no, at the time he was a uh, assistant at the Philadelphia DA office, oh, okay. a, a lawyer from Yale. Oh, okay. And so he was invited. He was brought on to, to the Warren Commission, and he's the one. He's the one that goes, yeah, this the magic bullet that went through. So the and so this is what the path of the magic bullet enters the back of JFK, exits JFK's neck, Ken, President Kennedy's neck. And as the back of uh, Governor Connolly, pierces Connolly's lung, destroys four inches of the left fifth rib, exits the front of Connolly's chest, enters the back of Connolly's wrist, shatters the distal end of the radius, which is a heavy bone in your arm, and the, c causes a commuted fracture of a six foot four man, exits the front of Connolly's wrist, and then enters the Connolly's left thigh. The mm -hmm. pack. So the magic bullet was labeled CE399 in evidence. Now, what happens is the FBI and CIA 
you know, treated the magic bullet as one of their foundational pillars in their investigation in the, for the Warren report. The chain of custody for anything is always a huge thing. The chain of custody for CE399 was called into question because Brian Edwards, who was a criminal justice instructor at Washburn University and author of one of the books that goes beyond the fence line, said chain of custody is vital for the integrity of evidence before it gets to court. CE399 was supposedly found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital Mm -hmm. and then went through several hands before it got to the Secret Service. The chain of custody goes Daryl Tomlinson, Parkland Maintenance, then o, uh, office uh, OP, whatever that stands for, I forgot, Wright, at, who was a Parkland personnel. Then it goes to Richard Johnson, who's the Secret Service, who carries it back to D.C. and delivers it to James Rowley, who's the Chief of Secret Service, who then gives it to uh, Special Agent Elmer, Ta- Elmer Lee Todd of the FBI, who delivers it to Robert Frazier at the FBI lab. That's the chain of custody that's documented. A private citizen named John Hunt, and this guy is, you talk about dedication. So he went to the Maryland National Archives several times, and he was focused on CE-399 because you could see the, uh, the, the bullet and, and everything on there, all, all the documented uh, pictures that was done yeah. by the FBI. With, let's add, a pristine, fine point, no significant damage. Yeah. You know, I, I referred to other bullets and stuff during our With podcast tippet, that, was that damaged. were broken and, and broken into bits or flattened. So- this, so this bullet is, is, is in, intact. It's intact with a sharp point on the tip, which leads to all kinds of questions. Yes. Right, and it was allowed to. And John Hunt, this private citizen, was allowed to set up a desk, his own computer, and his own scanner in the archives. And he did not interview. Uh, let's see what they said. He didn't interview any of the uh, police or the FBI personnel. He just wanted. He didn't want to get swayed by them. So he just basically took their own documents and asked them questions based on their own testimony, sworn testimony reports at the time using FBI and Warren Commission reports. And he asked, was CE-399, the bullet in evidence, the same as the one found on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital? Now, on November 22nd, 1963, at 7.30 p.m., a bullet appears on record. Specimen submitted for examination was what the FBI document says when they showed it. If the evidence was received by Agent Elmer Lee Todd, at the Washington field office at 7.30 p.m. Robert Frazier signs for it, who's the main investigator at the FBI lab. Multiple declassified documents show this, the, of those two million pages. Mm-hmm. But Todd receives the bullet CE-399 from Rowley at the White House, and the document signing it shows at 8.50 p.m. Well, how did he get it at 8.50? Because how could Frazier receive the bullet from Todd at 7.30 p.m.? when Todd only received the bullet from Raleigh at 8.50 p.m., therefore someone is lying about when they received the bullet. Yeah. Now you could say, look, Central Standard Time, Eastern Standard Time in D.C., maybe that was an hour difference, but then it's still a 20-minute gap, even if you do that. But they don't, these are FBI agents. And you could say, oh, it was one a one-time thing, but there are multiple documents citing this time difference. Yeah. Hmm. So then you go, okay, how does the guy at the lab say I received it at 7.30, but the person up top is saying ahead on the chain of custody says I received 850. Mm. So agent, and then what happens is for all these things, you have to initial the evidence. Agent Todd initialed the bullet C3 at 850, inscribed initials ET on the bullet itself. Everyone who received the bullet after that also initialed it. Robert Frazier, RF, Charles Killian, CK, Cortland Cunningham, JH, which is weird. I was like, Cortland Cunningham, shouldn't be CC. But <laughs> all right. Hey, man, everyone's got their own thing. And on a typed FBI document, it states Rowley gave Todd an envelope containing a bullet. This envelope and contents were taken directly to the FBI lab and delivered to Frazier. The envelope was opened and initials both of, of both Todd and Frazier were etched on the nose of the bullet for ID purposes. This is on the printed document that was invented. So, however, upon the artifact examination, Todd's initials do, are not on the bullet. Elmer Lee Todd's initials are not there. Robert Frazier's are. Charles Killian's are, and Cortland Cunningham's initials are present. No initials or markings were made below the nose of the bullet. Dr. Gary Aguilar, who was the clinical professor at uh, University of California, San Francisco, an ophthalmologist, was curious about this. Because, you know, I just, I just, I gave his title, but this would be a private citizen. And so the FBI memo dated June 24th, 1964, cited that neither uh, Daryl C. Tomlinson, who found the bullet at Parkland, nor O.P. Wright, the P.O. at Parkland, a uh, personal officer who obtained the bullet from Tomlinson and gave it to Agent Johnson could identify that as the bullet. This was made aware to the Warren Commission in an internal document. Dr. Aguilar spoke to Agent Bardwell Odom, who 
who apparently car- on the paperwork was that he carried and the bullet around. They sent him the declassified document and the internal document. And after seeing it and speaking to him on the phone, he said, I'd never carried the bullet. Mm. I'd never showed it to anyone because if I had, I would have filed something called a 302. And they were very particular in that era about paperwork, especially for that incident. Sure, sure. So there were no 302 reports in any of the 2 million declassified documents that they could find. The document states that Daryl Tomlinson was shown CE-399, a rifle slug by Agent, by Agent <coughs> Odom, dated June 12, 1964, which was called Commission Exhibit 2011. Uh, so what happened to it, and, or is Odom lying? That, that's the question. Yeah. So how did this bullet end up in evidence in the FBI lab as the magic bullet? The FBI was so, because the FBI was convinced of Oswald's guilt. And they did it, and so did that lead to a sloppy or fraudulent chain of custody? Yeah. Now, did they, or did they switch out the bullet? Now, neither of the two Parkland employees, Tomlinson or Wright, or agents Crow- Rowley or Johnson, could identify that bullet, nor could the agent who apparently carried around Odom, which cast suspicions about CE-399. Now, Dr. Henry Lee, who's a forensic scientist at New, uh, University of New Haven, says chain of custody begins at the crime scene, not at the lab. You can't say, oh, well, it's at 8.50. It doesn't work with any. So did Lee, so each piece of evidence is photographed and documented to be preserved properly and sent to lab. So the chain of custody protocol doesn't change just because you go to a lab. And they say who examines it, who found it, and how they examined it. If the chain is broken, then the evidence becomes inadmissible or tainted. The lack of damage to yeah. CE 399 was another problem. No real damage to the bullet that passed through two adult men, including striking bones. So there's a guy named Dr. Joseph Dulce who was a battlefield surgeon from World War II. He was brought on to the War, uh, Warren Commission. He was one of the medical professionals brought on there. He's also a surgeon and U.S. Army ballistics expert. He worked for the Warren Commission, and during video testimony, said he and his team were given the exact rifle by, by Oswald and 100 bullets used of the same caliber used by Oswald. They went and shot similar cadaver wrists. Mm-hmm. In every incidence, the front or tip of the bullet was smashed, all right. 100 bullets. It's he found that sense. under no circumstances could the bullet hit Conley's wrist and not be deformed. Yep. Yet C-399's front tip and nose were not damaged. Dulce concluded that two bullets struck Conley. He's like, yeah, no, Con- I'm not saying Conley didn't get shot, but he was. But since Spectre pre-screened the medical witnesses for the Warren Commission, Dulce's report and testimony was never presented. Uh, yeah. And his name is not even mentioned in the Warren report. So, and then even Governor Connolly, who was in bed at the time, re- recovering from the incident, said, yeah, I don't buy the magic bullet theory. But he yeah. says that, you know, but. Yeah. So Senator German, uh, John Sherman Cooper of Kentucky, who was one of the people on the Warren Commission, he was the first member who agreed to speak on TV, and he claimed that there were multiple disagreements, especially on whether the first shot went through Kennedy and Connolly. The Warren report never specified the order of the shots, but claimed one bullet went through JFK and Connolly, while another hit a bystander, James Tagg, by the underpass. Mm-hmm. And the final one kills JFK in the headshot. Cooper could not convince himself to buy the magic bullet theory, nor could Senator Russell, who's from Georgia, who's also on there, who did not want to serve on the commission initially because after the first meeting, he goes, he became disenchanted with the proceedings. And in his own uh, particular personal memo in Georgia says, the roles of Hoover and acting uh, Attorney General Nicholas Ka- uh, Katzenbach, he said that they knew something because he said after the meeting on Dece- De- executive meeting on December 5th, 1963, something strange is happening. Warren and Kotzenbach know all about FBI and apparently plan on showing that Oswald is the only is the only one to be considered. This to me is an untenable position. This is his personal note. In, in yeah, so he he knew he w- he knew within two weeks that there was something going on. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. buying it. Yep. So he wrote a dissenting opinion for presentation of the final commission meeting on September 18th and shared his concerns on a recorded call with President Johnson, which got, you know. Sure. So Johnson asked, what, what difference does it make which bullet hit Connolly? Russell replies, it doesn't, take much, it doesn't make much difference, but the commission believes that the same bullet that hit Kennedy hit Connolly. Well, I don't believe it. I'm going to give it Southern accent. Cause <laughs> Johnson replies, I don't either. Russell oh. says, and of course... The fellow, if the fellow was accurate enough to hit Kennedy right in the neck with one shot and knock his head off with the next one, according to that theory, he'd not only miss the whole automobile, but he missed the street. Well, a man that's good enough to put a sh- uh, good enough shot to put two bullets right into Kennedy, he didn't miss the whole automobile, and so I couldn't sign it. And I said that Conley, and and I said that Conley testified directly to the contrary, and I'm not I'm not going to approve any of this. And then Russell also believed that Oswald did not act alone, Senator Russell. 
He was strongly influenced by the Zabruder film and the testimony of Connolly. Therefore, they could not rule out conspiracy, despite eventually agreeing that all the shots came from the sixth floor of the book depository. Russell Cooper and Haley Boggs, who was a representative from Louisiana, who was also a member of the Warren Commission, criticized the report in public. And uh, Walter Cronkite, who interviewed McCloy, who was a presidential advisor, who was also on the commission, during a four-night special that was hosted by Dan Rather, McCloy never answered Cronkite's question about the integrity of the Warren report. But another matter arose. CBS, Roger, uh, uh, CBS employee Roger Feynman discovered an internal document showing McCloy consulted extensively with his daughter, Ellen, who, before appearing with Cronkite, was an administrative assistant to CBS President Richard Salant. In 1992, after the AARB was created because of the JFK thing, Jer- Jerry uh, Polakoff, who was a reporter, and he's on the Assassination Archives Research Center, the director, confronted Salon and Ellen McCloy about the document revealing McCloy's instructions uh, for the content of the show. Only then did they admit that to their concealment. CBS and NBC's and New York Times continued to support the Warren Report and never investigated or reviewed the 26 volumes of supplemental evidence. I, I mean, I stop right there because this all comes down focusing on the bullet. Yeah. Now, let's talk about uh, one of the biggest culprits in uh, kind of uh, supporting the, the conspiracy theories and all that is the movie JFK. And there's that, you know, dramatic courtroom scene where Kevin Costner as Jim Garrison is taught, you know, back and to the left, back and to the left. And he talks about the bullet stopping and turning in midair, which was famously parodied on Seinfeld and maybe coincidentally or not so coincidentally, uh, Wayne Knight appeared in both of those. <laughs> Wayne right. Knight was in the Seinfeld recreation, and he was also in JFK. Now, the problem I have with the depiction of the path of the magic bullet in JFK is that I've seen documentaries where they place, you know, a melon or a, a ballistics dummy or something where Kennedy would have been sitting, and it's fairly common knowledge now, even though most people might not know this, but Connolly was sitting in a jump seat, like a fold down jump seat, which did not put him directly in front of Kennedy. He was sat this way. And if you watch the Zapruder film, he was kind of turned in a, a kind of a weird angle. And people have proven time and time again, firing from that angle, they would create like scaffolding to put the shooter where Oswald was, that that bullet could have theoretically passed through JFK into Connolly's back, exit Connolly, shatter his wrist, and 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 uh, lodge into his leg. And if you watch the Zapruder film very, very closely, as they exit from behind the uh, Stemmons freeway sign, you see the back of the freeway sign where there is a splice in the film. This is another thing that conspiracy theorists look at. Yeah. Some jackass had broken the Zapruder film and was had learned that when you have a splice, if you want to fix a splice, you cut two frames and then glue it back together. This guy cut two frames out of the film and glued it back together. (laughs) And so now you see this splice when uh, Kennedy passes behind the the freeway. There's a weird jump. Drives me crazy, yeah. So anyways, they exit from behind the, the Stemmons freeway sign, and immediately at that moment, you kind of see Connolly's wrist kind of yeah jerk and but somehow he's still clinging to his hat which is kind of odd but you do see his wrist like violently move and at that point kennedy's hands come up to an awkward position as he's reacting to the gun wound so theoretically jfk planted the seed in people's minds that the bullet took this magic path when in reality it could have very well have been a straight path through kennedy to to Connolly. My problem is that pristine bullet. Yeah. When I saw images of it, I said, that's, that's horse hockey. And, and again, it, it, it's, it's kind of, you kind of help, can't help but think that it's prosecutors trying to cement their narrative and say, well, we have the bullet and and case closed. And it's clearly not the bullet. It's clearly not the bullet. Now, A friend of mine, uh, Dennis, who's been he's been going down the rabbit hole watching all these conspiracy documentaries on YouTube and stuff. He shared something that he learned with me the other day, and 
again, I, I don't know if this is true or not. This is hearsay. It's inadmissible as evidence. Um, but he said that uh, some FBI agent claims that after the assassination, he looked into the limo and saw this pristine bullet laying on the floor of the limo and thought this might be important, took it with him to Parkland Hospital. I don't know if him or somebody else would change hands, but somehow it was set down, maybe on the stretcher. I don't know. And then someone said, well, what's this? There was a news report Picked on that. Up. That guy just came out and, yeah, yeah. he was recently on the news. Oh. So how did that bullet land on the floor of the, the limo pristine? Maybe it was ejected from somebody's rifle and landed in the limo, maybe at a completely different time when, yeah. you know, maybe days or weeks or months in advance that pristine bullet could have been laying in the limo. This FBI picks it up, it changes hands, and now all of a sudden it's it's submitted as evidence. Huh. Um, but that, that bullet, they, they had to have been idiots to suggest that this is the bullet that passed between two men because it clearly didn't. Well, it clearly didn't. Well, it was Arlen Specter, yeah. a non, a, not a medical doctor yeah. who pre-screened that. That's what I, I didn't know about Arlen Specter's involvement in this. And when I said Arlen Specter and this guy's pre-screened the medical witnesses and they brought several on them, then why exclude the person? Because it doesn't fit the narrative yeah, exactly. of, of the magic bullet theory. And the Warren Commission was limited to three bullets because they only found three casings on the sixth floor. So they said it can't be anything more than three bullets because then yeah. we have a problem. Yeah. So and if there is another <laughs> shell case in there, like, we it have a problem that we can't. can't uh, yeah, we can't explain it. because yeah. we have three shell cases. And Hoover's like, we have three shell cases. And the FBI uh, ballistic experts said they all came from the same rifle. It's an open and shut case. Yeah. And that's what he's telling Josh Johnson's like, all right, just get it done. Yeah. Yeah, I remember hearing uh, there was a documentary that supposedly had an audio recording of the number of shots that were fired because somebody claims that a police officer's uh, microphone was left open and they they count multiple shots. But I go with the, the echo three, but... thing. That could be the echo thing, too. Yeah, That's exactly. So it's hard to – there's so much noise and static and all sorts like of I stuff. Like I said, I, I accept – I'll go with the theory that Oswald killed Kennedy, but you, the echo thing doesn't put – you know – I yeah. mean, the, the multiple shot with because of the echoes, it doesn't sway me one way or another. It's as he, yeah. you haven't convinced me. They now said that. that that you know that as I'm gathering information, that eyewitness testimony from multiple people who claim to have seen a muzzle flash and a puff of smoke. That's hard to ignore. Yeah, that's really hard yeah. to ignore to say uh, they didn't see. Anything. I'm flip flopping here. I will mm -hmm. say this, but uh, I hate to say, it, but when we have mass shootings here. People have claimed they've hurt all sorts of things. Yeah. That's why you get early reports. Yeah. Oh, we have 50 people killed and they're multiple shooters because of the yeah. echo, because when people are running around, you don't know who's what. Yeah. So I'm not saying they're all lying, but I can understand why they, they think mm -hmm. it's real. If I hook them up all up to a, a polygraph machine, they'll swear. It'll say they're telling the truth because they felt that. Yeah. I can't. They can't. The machine's like, yeah, they think they're telling the truth. Here's a here's an interesting twist, and again, I, I think I heard little bits and pieces of this, but then I just read it again recently. Uh, Woody Harrelson's father, who has an extensive criminal record, I th I think he may have been in prison for a long time. I don't know if he's still alive. He claimed to have been part of the JFK assassination, and they're like, "Well, where were you?" And you've heard the story of the hobos. Did you guys hear about yes. the hobos up yeah. by the train tracks? Yep. that they were rounded up by police and people noticed that they were like clean shaven and had clean nails and clean shoes and they just didn't look like typical hobos. Some people have done like photo analysis and claim that one of those hobos was Woody Harrelson's father. Now, I haven't done the research myself. Again, I haven't yeah. compared. Um, but apparently all three of those hobos uh, have been identified and, and accounted for. So... You know, all this speculation just goes flying. Now, here's the interesting thing about JFK, the movie, is that, you know, Oliver Stone had a, a viewpoint and he tried to shoehorn right. all the facts into his viewpoint. And I had read that a lot of what you see depicted in the movie, which came from a variety of sources, may have originated with Russia. Russia had a disinformation propaganda division, and in the wake of the Kennedy assassination, they were putting out propaganda saying it was this, that, and the other thing. And in Oliver Stone's attempt to gather that information and tell a story, 
included a lot of stuff that may have been disproved um, because it originated from Russia. And a lot of experts on the assassination called JFK trash, the movie. And Stone himself says, I didn't make a documentary. I'm telling right. a narrative. Right. So right. even he says, don't read too much into my film. Um, but I think the movie has caused a lot of the, the, the conspiracy theories that we see today based on disinformation. And it all kind of stemmed from this movie, which was a huge success. I mean, right. it was a phenomenon. Um, and so Ironically, in a way it gave rise to the ARB and which is where that's why I said, I will only take evidence from that because mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, HSCA declassified. This is the stuff that was supposed to be locked away until 2029. So I don't, I don't, really partake in like oh i can recreate a, a you know this and that this is all deep everything that i read came from because i they showed the documents and these are the dd classified documents that were taken from the national archives these are fbi documentation so this is official stuff that's why i don't want to go into i i my focus has to be i have to have an anchor point i can't be like dorothy going off <laughs> Wizard of Oz. like i can't do that there has to be yeah. like like inception i have to spin the little token <laughs> and let us keep the, the top is like spin, like are we spinning or not otherwise you'll go down the rabbit hole right, and yes. you know people are like oh the hobos and and this and that like well if yeah. it, i go by documentation you have to give me evidence because like i said you have to convince me that it wasn't just oswald having a bad day yeah, yeah. <laughs> now speaking of the movie jfk i watched it again recently or fast forwarded through quite a bit of it because it's a three hour plus movie um but check out this cast all right we got kevin costner as jim garrison uh, Gary Oldman, who, out of all the depictions of Lee Harvey Oswald, his is uncanny. And when you watch footage of, of Oswald addressing uh, the press, and he also took part in a talk show where he talked about Marxism. And that's the thing. He's not a, he wasn't a communist. He was a Marxist, he claims. Um, but Gary Oldman mimicked his speech patterns and the way – he pursed his lips and everything. It's it's he's an a, amazing portrayal. It's fine, really he's amazing. He's a fine thespian. Yeah. Um, and Jack Lemon, Walter Matthau, who did not appear together. I wish they would have. <laughs> uh, Ed Asner, Sissy Spacek, Brian Doyle Murray for some reason is Jack Ruby, Wayne Knight, who I said you know appeared in Seinfeld, mocking his uh, performance in the movie. Michael Rooker, who I love, Lori Metcalf, who used to be on yep. the Roseanne show. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Pesci is David Ferry with those crazy painted on eyebrows and really <laughs> bad hair piece. Tommy Lee Jones, uh, John Candy, <laughs> and Oliver Stone said he cast John Candy because he had, he bore an uncanny resemblance to the character that he was portraying in the movie, so oh. he wanted John Candy. And it was John Candy's uh, probably first and only dramatic role that he yeah. ever played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kevin Bacon, Donald Sutherland is X, which I have found out just today. X is a fictional character. Yeah. It's sort of a composite of different characters. And that's always a red flag to me when you create these fictional characters to kind of streamline the story. And then making an appearance as Chief Justice Earl Warren was Jim Garrison. Jim Garrison, who is being played by Kevin Costner, Costner. appears in the film as Justice Earl wow. Warren. That's surreal to yeah. me. That yeah. kind of makes my brain hurt. Wow. Um, so it's a well-acted movie. It's a well-crafted movie. And Stone may be doing this deliberately incorporated archival footage with recreations to kind of blur the line of, between fact and fiction. But you could watch the movie. You can enjoy it. But please don't use it as a reference when you're citing yeah. conspiracy theories because yeah. there's not a whole lot of accuracy there. My, my personal opinion is that I think, I think Stone did it to light a fire under the Justice Department's ass because they were supposed to have released documents. They didn't do it. And then maybe he was always interested in this project, and he did it, but at the sure. time that he released it was 1991. And yeah, it yeah. led to, because people yeah. saw it and went, oh, my God, this has to be true. Oh, it Everything definitely it, renewed interest and, in and it. And that yeah. outcry made Congress pass the John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Act. Yeah. Or the John F. Kennedy Records Act of 1992. And that's what gave rise to the ARB. And that's now, ironically, is how all those documents got declassified. And that's where you see, like, how does a bullet do, do this and not get damaged? And then the chain of custody is in, in, in question now. So now... And that was the one that they 
using against Oswald. So now that's a huge piece of evidence that, you know, if you were prosecuting Oswald, and all of a sudden you can use the bullet from the from the shots fired, you'd be like, well, that's you just chopped off one of my legs. And that's a huge thing because mm. then you're like, hey, what else did you guys do just for sake of convenience? These were all left out. And then when the doctor's reporter said, hey, it can't be that bullet because that bullet would have been smashed. So then it would all that it would do is create reasonable doubt that it's not just Oswald. And then all of a sudden Oswald has to be detained and they have to interview, interrogate. Who knows what he might say if he keeps saying right. I was a patsy, I was a patsy. Yeah. You know, do we would we have to have uh, Jeffrey Epstein him before Jeffrey Epstein yeah. existed? <laughs> yeah. That's probably what happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, my third movie uh, about the JFK assassination is Parkland, which I yep. just watched a few weeks ago. Uh, released in 2013, which would have been the 50th anniversary of the assassination. Uh, I really enjoyed the film. It doesn't have really high uh, ratings on Rotten Tomatoes, but I actually enjoyed it. Uh, the cast includes Zac Efron in a surprisingly dramatic role. Ron Livingston, who was from uh, the movie Office yep. Space, yeah, he's he great. plays FBI agent James Hostie stationed in Dallas. David Harbour, who we all know from uh, uh, Stranger yep. Things yep. and other things. Tom Welling, formerly Superman, uh, Billy yeah. Bob Thornton, Paul Giamatti as Zapruder. Mm. One, I think maybe one of, if not the only film that actually depicts yep. Zapruder as a character. He makes, you see him in the background in JFK and Ruby and stuff like that. But he, uh, Paul Giamatti is Zapruder and they talk about what his life was like and what his day was like after recording the, uh, the thing on film, the, the assassination on film. Uh, now here's an interesting thing that I was not aware of as I watched the film. And then I've since been able to validate this in my online research is one of the things that the movie touches on is the fact that, uh, the Dallas branch of the FBI, uh, had Lee Harvey Oswald on their radar long before the assassination. And when he would be out of town going to new Orleans or Mexico city, agents would go to the Payne house and interrogate Ruth Payne and Marina about Oswald's activities. Well, when Oswald returned and Marina said there were some local FBI agents here grilling us, Oswald went to the FBI letter in hand and said, leave my wife alone. According to some sources, he made threats. Other sources say, well, he just said he was going to take this to a higher authority. Yeah. But he basically wrote a letter saying, leave my wife alone. If you want questions answered, you come to me and talk to me directly. Following the assassination, they all looked at each other and said, we had him here in our office just weeks before the assassination. And if we would have labeled that letter a threat, we could have jailed him. Yeah. And this would have never have happened. All they would have had to do is, is have a judge sign off on it in yeah. the middle of the night and pick him up. Now, they, in the they, movie... They, they would have had probable cause to yeah. detain him, at least, yeah. Yeah. for 24 hours or however long. Right. Now, in the movie, uh, I think it's the hostie character says, you know, I get these every day. I just don't put any weight in it. It's like, yeah, but imagine when this gets out to the public. So what did they do? In real life and in the movie, hostie superior ordered that letter destroyed. Oh, and so obviously now people know that again, what are conspiracy theorists going to do with that? Why did you destroy that letter? You had Oswald in, in your grasp and you let him go. Anytime you destroy, why did the FBI destroy, why did the Pentagon destroy its Kennedy file? Yeah. Like why guys uh, you're just running out of space. Yeah. I mean, you, you have all sorts of other stuff, but you can't hold on to that. Or, stuff. or, they were questioning while he was gone. They were questioning and getting information because they planned on using him as a patsy, yeah. and then they destroyed the evidence yeah. to cover their own paper trail. Who knows? And that's uh, <laughs> Miss Hall, Patricia Hall, at the rooming house. That's one of the things she told me is that as they were planning this, if you believe in this conspiracy thing, they're like, "Who do we know that's in the area?" Because they published the motorcade path in the newspapers. Personally, I think that's what killed Kennedy was publishing the route. Um, but if you believe in the conspiracy thing, they looked at their list of contacts and people and said, "Hey, this Oswald guy works at the uh, the book depository, which is on the parade route. Let's set him up as the patsy." And so again, if you believe in that, that explains why Oswald was sitting in the break room like. 
what now? What's happening? And then slowly realizing, holy cow, they're setting me up for this thing. Right. And what's interesting, and I was I was going to try and cue up this sound bite. I don't know if I have it here. But what's interesting is when Oswald was being grilled by the press and they said, uh, you've been accused of uh, assassinating the president. He said, I have not been charged with that. And the first I heard of it was by one of you press guys out in the hallway just now. Wow. And he's yeah. like, they only brought me in because of my Russia connections. And when you watch that again, this is another thing that makes you start to question the whole machine. Like yeah. he sounds very convincing. Yeah. And so he was maintaining uh, in front of the press that he was a patsy that uh that his russia connections is what uh set him up for this and uh and then he got silenced on his way out so i mean my thing is you, like the, the born commission you put alan dulles on there that's like putting steve bannon on anything involving trump <laughs> yes <laughs> i'd be like okay this automatically invalidates this entire thing what yeah, he's yeah. he's an impartial guy you're going to put on there right so right. when they put alan dulles on there on the warren commission i went okay this is going to be a, a fun thing and you were talking about the cops had uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Like, why? Same things. How many times have we seen with mass shooters? The main shooter recently. Yeah. The main police Just were, were tipped off they, about yeah, him. Yeah, they had a huge paper trail and, on this guy and didn't address it. And this yeah. is what. So you hear these incidents that happen repeatedly. So it's not out of the realm of possibility yeah. that that could happen. It's just like you said. You keep stacking. Like, okay, I got to put in the call and question this. I got and I go. What I look at the Warren Commission. What did you guys investigate then? Yeah. What, yeah, how exactly. many different holes am I going to find in this thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andrew. Yes. Based on all the evidence and theories and hearsay, what is your conclusion? I think. Um, I. I <clears throat> man, it's hard to say. That the the CIA is not listening. Go ahead. No, no, yeah. no. I I do think. I do think the CIA was involved. Um, JFK famous, famously said, I want to smash the CIA yeah. into a thousand pieces. He had a lot of enemies. I mean, he fired Dulles because of the Bay of Pigs on one of them. Right. Yeah. And then also, I I know, Nick, you've heard of it. Joe, have you heard of Operation Northwoods? Yeah. I don't think I've heard of that. Ex explain. No, no, you. Okay. You're, you're... So they, they had planned to paint... Two or three airliners, and this Joe, this is going to sound really familiar. Mm -hmm. To to paint two or three uh, airliners, uh, wait, I'm trying to, to attack the U.S. Is that what you're right, getting at? Right. And, and, now I didn't know the name of it, but I have heard of yeah. that. Right. Uh, and, and 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 pay uh, Cuban nationals to to c commit uh, terrorist acts in Miami and Washington. Right. And then plan it all and. You know the CIA is going to plan it and then and use blame it you Cuba. as an excuse to, to invade, invade Cuba. Yeah, and when he said when that when they offered that to him, he was furious. Yeah. And, oh yeah, yeah. Right, and so he said, "Come if you want, come up with something else." And they came up with Bay of Pigs, and he went, "This this is the best you can do." Right. Yeah. Right. And he didn't support it enough because he's like, "I can't. This this is this is not covert. This is like blatant invasion." Yeah. Right. Now, you, you guys want to hear something crazy. My own little personal connection to this. Um, my father was in the Navy. He was stationed in Florida for a short time before being uh, shipped out to Spain where he met my mother. And he had some mental health issues. He was he was hospitalized for a while with mental health issues. And, I'm, and I don't know much about him. He died when he was 35. I was probably seven or something when he died. And I remember talking to an aunt and uncle. My aunt is my dad's half-sister. And I was trying to get some information about my dad, just trying to figure out what kind of person he was. I only have some sporadic memories of him. And we talked about his mental health issues. And here's what my aunt and uncle said to me. He was never the same since uh, the Bay of Pigs. Oh. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, that's that's all we can really say. And oh. I'm like, okay, what the, what's going on yeah. here? What was my father's role in the Bay of Pigs? can't just drop the nugget yeah. on you and just say, <laughs> I can't talk about Area 51. Wait, what, what did Pro you say? I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think there were any Americans on the ground no, there in Cuba, but, but they helped ferry them 
Yeah. yeah. And they were supposed supposed to support that invasion yeah. with uh, air cover and stuff, which Kennedy withdrew and yeah. left these right. guys get slaughtered, basically. So yeah. basically, he had when you're talking about enemies, he had enemies on the ones who were abandoned, and he had enemies like, oh, you were going to planning on invade us, so we hate, so both oh, sides. Castro of- spent the rest of his life never trusting the U.S. again because he knew they oh, were yeah. behind it. Absolutely, yeah. um, but but also. Um, we were trickling slowly into Vietnam. Yeah. Um, uh, since, I, I, since Eisenhower. Eisenhower, he, he had sent advise, advisors. Yeah, uh, advisors. They, they I think, from what I've heard and gathered, they were kind of, they were doing some shady stuff on the ground, assassinations and stuff. Mm-hmm. But in terms of troops on the ground, as we would call it today, they it didn't really exist. And the whole military industrial complex was pushing towards it because, hey, we won World War II. Yeah. Uh, well, we're we're not going to talk about Korea, but <laughs> hey, we can we can keep going with Vietnam. Yeah. And I truly felt that even Eisenhower in his farewell address he warned against it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Like, where to get ahead of the curve there? On the way out, beware the military. But, I'm like, you help build it. Yeah, <laughs> but I. Th- but you help build it. He, you can't be like, beware Frankenstein's monster. He, I built it. He, he at <laughs> least, I mean, to his credit, he at least addressed it. But I truly think that. Kennedy did not want to go along with no. with with a full scale invasion. Yeah, and what happened uh, within one year of his assassination, the uh, uh, Goff and Tonkin yeah. incident, which was also faked. Yeah, that Johnson used. Oh as yeah, a, they, as oh, the false excuse, flag operations. False yeah. flag as an excuse to send four hundred thousand U.S. troops they, there, and uh, th- I think the establishment did not believe that Kennedy would allow such a thing, yeah. simply because he. He shot down Operation Northwoods. He would never go along with the Gulf of Tonkin yeah, resolution. Yeah. Now let's talk about Johnson. No, no relation. Um, <laughs> talking to Patricia Hall, who uh, owned the rooming house, we got into this conversation about Johnson and her, as well as a lot of conspiracy theorists. They say that Johnson was the head of the snake of of this plot. Oh wow! Johnson was the head. Uh, the mob was angry at JFK because his, his father. father Joseph yeah. implored uh, the, the mob and uh, he the beat Richard by the t- and hair all that. of his chinny chin chin. Yeah, and they said, "We, if you get J- JFK into the White House, you know, with the Teamsters and and Hoffa and all that stuff." There's another local connection. Yeah. Hoffa was part of this. They said, "If you if you tell your your Teamsters to vote for JFK." will act in your best interest. They do. They hand out leaflets. They tell everyone, vote for JFK. He gets into office, and Bobby Kennedy turns on the mob <laughs> yeah. and yeah. starts going after the mob. That's right, he did. So there's one faction where they were like, we put this guy in office, and now they've turned their backs on us. There's one aspect. The other aspect is the CIA and all that. And and there's a quote out there, and again, I'd have to validate this, but I had read that a mistress or a secretary or something to Johnson heard him say out loud, after tomorrow, we won't have to deal with those Kennedy boys anymore. And Kennedy was assassinated the next day. But again, hearsay because yeah. it's, prove it. He said, she said. And right. Anytime, anytime anyone comes up with, I heard or I heard them say, I'm like, well, you can't prove yeah. it. So we have to dis- disavow because now, that, I could easily put on the other side. Dallas or... uh Johnson was a Dallas boy. Yeah, he was a Texan. Had lots of connections in Dallas. Maybe some people had the authority to change the parade route to go right past the book depository. But uh, the, the, <laughs> let me ask the, you both. A few days before that, H.W. Uh, Bush was in Dallas also, and hmm. we all know that he has long been a CIA asset. Well, let me uh, ask so. you this. Uh, let's. I want to get both of your opinions on this. It's the the ultimate question. Let's say the conspiracy theories are right. For the, let's entertain it for a brief second. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that the presidency is just a figurehead, someone to speak to the press, to um, put Americans at ease, but that the the government is really ran covertly by organizations that we don't elect, that we don't appoint, that uh, kind of call the shots. And does that's that terrify that you or does that it terrifies if you, me. It if, you terrifies keep, me. if you keep your head down and mind your P's and Q's, you have nothing to be worried about and yeah. you'll be safe and secure under this very volatile, unpredictable, 
their interests shifted the whim, and their interests may not always be yours. Yeah, it's. I find it that terrifying. That president, and I don't want to get into the whole nine eleven thing, but when you think about our invasion of Iraq in the wake of nine eleven, and only to find out that they had absolutely nothing to do with it. Yep. Yet Saudi Arabia where most of the hijackers j- jackers came from, yep. they were not on a Muslim ban list. They are con- continue to be allies with the U.S. What the and, hell is going on? And it's on? been proven they help, that their, their CIA uh, helped fund uh, part of this. But so. this comes on to the other thing. <laughs> Once World War II ended, the OSS, the precursor of the CIA, saw that, okay, we got rid of Hitler. Now we know communism with the... With, uh, but Stalin is the next big threat. Yep. And they even recruited Nazis to work on the space program. Yep. That's been yep. documented. So that if we had to pick between fascists and communists, they'll pick fascists. Yeah. So America, okay. America always picked fascists over communists. Right. And yeah. so here's the thing. Even within our own country. And we keep giving them funding, whether it's shadow funding or two point three trillion in the last year and how much of that goes. But it, it they're yeah, funded. Yeah. They're funded to serve American interests, whatever that means. Bad or good. Yep. Usually bad. <laughs> and you say we're a democracy. We elect our government officials. Our government officials then summon CIA and FBI to Capitol Hill to say, hey, what are you guys doing in our name? Tell us how you're keeping us safe and all that. Say, well, you can tell your figurehead political appointee, but the for me, the deputy director of the CIA is the more powerful one because hmm. they're they're not a they're not a political employee. Yeah, employee. they're they're, they're actually career part, politician. part of the what you would call. The but that goes state. back to what yeah. Joe was saying. Right. OK, worst case scenario. They're in charge. Mm-hmm. And who are they? You yeah. don't know who they are. They they exist, but you don't know who they are. Yeah. So do you want to go to that Saturday barbecue and go check out the new Godzilla film <laughs> and go have an ice cream on a Saturday night? You're fine. No no harm, no foul. Just yeah. what are you going to do to challenge it? But if you're Epstein, somehow in a jail cell, well, security cameras are turned off, he, guards yeah, are looking hours, the other but way. The, thing. the guards are sleeping no, for no, but, two hours. But here's the thing. He wanted to be that. He didn't just randomly fall into it. He actively wanted to be a power player. So yeah. if you oh. want to enter their world, he wasn't a you played by their rules. Yeah, no, he, no, he, he was. <laughs> he had ambitions. If you yeah, follow whatever good, story about Jeffrey Epstein, he angled himself. I want to be in that circle. Yep. I want to be in yep. that Bilderberg group who meet, you know, secretly the power players. Who, yeah. Okay, you want to go there, then you know what you have to sacrifice. You, you're not going to go. You know, I get my yeah. car washed on a Friday night and I <laughs> kick my feet up and have a couple of beers and watch the football game. Nope. I go to yeah. Joe just went to the Monday night football game. It was wonderful. Go Lions. <laughs> but, you know, do these people get to enjoy that? Yeah. No. And that, you know, the Epstein thing and all this other stuff we're talking about, that to me illustrates the power of this shadow government that they're so arrogant and so cocky that. They can bump off someone like Epstein, make it so obvious that it wasn't a suicide, yeah. and there's nothing any of us can nothing, say or do. Nothing. And they're Joe, lighting you, cigars and laughing. Do you have any nieces or nephews? Or yeah, anything like that? yeah. Okay. Say one of them gets recruited because they're they, they what well, doesn't have to be Ivy League, but they're just recruit. They're, they're recruited by the FBI or CIA. Ten years from now, they pull Uncle Joe to a side. Uncle Joe, I want to tell you something. I heard your, I remember the podcast you did with your buddies back. <laughs> Got to tell you some things. You can't leave this room because you know I don't want to have to do anything. <laughs> what do you tell you? This is I'm Uncle Joe. And they could tell you and they'd say, wow, my niece and nephews now enter that shadow world. It's, yeah, like, yeah. it's all true. Whatever you think, it's all true. That's all I'll say. Yeah. yeah. What do we say? I mean, that's your, that's your blood. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, wow, right. I never thought that, but yeah. So in, in summary, I personally believe it was a lone gunman. And the, the reason I say this is you can go throughout history. Let's look at John Wilkes Booth, who thought he would be hailed as a hero after assassinating Lincoln and was shocked, shocked that people mourned his death. And he was an arrogant sociopath actor who uh, thought he was making the world a better place by doing what he did and was shocked that the world reacted the way they did. I don't know, Joe. Did anybody flying the Confederate flags really think he's not a hero these <laughs> Let's look at Hinckley. Right. Let's look at um, uh, what's the, Chapman. He's the guy who shot uh, uh, John Lennon. He did it in the name of religion, or so he claims. He said that when the Beatles made the statement about being bigger than Jesus, he became obsessed with taking Lennon out. He thought he would be 
hailed as a hero. In reality, what all of these people have in common is that they're small, tiny, insignificant people who will be forgotten unless they hitch their wagon to someone more famous than, than them and will be forever included in conversations about JFK, about Lincoln, about John Lennon, about Reagan. Um, they're small, pathetic sociopaths who yearn to be remembered for something bigger, and that's what motivates these people to take out uh, these people. Again, I, I feel that the publication of the motorcade and the newspaper and the days leading up to the motorcade is what sealed the deal. I have this vision of Oswald sitting in the break room, eating a sandwich, reading the paper, and discovering that the motorcade is going right past the school book depository where he had only been working for a few weeks and thought, well, this is fate. This is destiny. Um, Miss uh, Hall, uh, Patricia Hall said he had nothing personal against JFK. And I heard a quote that said he did not kill John Kennedy. He killed the president of the United States because he wanted to be remembered for something bigger rather than just be forgotten as a loner loser. I'll tell you so what, that's, that's a perfect profile for a patsy. That a, too. That's a perfect psychological but profile for a patsy. The world is full of sociopaths. More of them are uh, revealing themselves over the past few years. It's it's like the Oxford shooter, Ethan Crumbly. You, you could tell yeah. by things that he, he said. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm nothing. I'm not going to be anything in life. At least they'll know me for this. Exactly. And he plan and he planned on uh, surviving so he could watch the terror yeah. that unfolded around him. That is so yeah effing sick. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't. It wasn't a suicide mission for him because as soon as he was confronted by the police, he dropped his weapon oh, yeah. and surrendered. He he, so he wanted he to wanted see. to bask in it, and that's why. Ruby says that he pulled the trigger as he saw Oswald basking in this, that he saw the smugness in his face that just just motivated him to pull the trigger. So in my opinion, all of these lone gunmen have something in common, and until something is revealed, um, I'm going to stick with the lone gunman uh, theory. Now, who knows? Maybe some records will be unsealed and they're going to say yes we have evidence of a shooter in the grassy knoll but well if they say zero percent i i'm you know not convinced 100 percent i'm convinced i would say and i'm i'm about 35 percent. if i was at zero everything i'm seeing being declassified it's moving me away from it's just oswald but i'm not there yet right now if you ask me still after everything i've seen it's still oswald yeah. But everything that I'm seeing with the bullet and the chain of custody and the, F and the FBI documents, the declassified stuff, it you know like the 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 gauge is shifting over yeah. and over with the existing information. So, yeah. like I said, as time goes by, and like I'm, unfortunately, Joe's kind of set me on this path. <laughs> so I'm like, All right, I got to keep. <laughs> yes, it. you did it. You did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah, I, I rarely, if anyone knows, me, I, I rarely walk in with notes to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first time I was like, I, I couldn't remember all this stuff on this. It's just too much. I didn't even I didn't put down stopping here due to time constraints. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, yeah, oh, uh, we've uh, this is the longest podcast we've ever done, but, yes, uh, it, but... it really is worthy of of the in depth uh, conversation that we've had. Again, the 60th anniversary this month. You're going to be seeing a lot of documentaries. Uh, pro conspiracy, pro lone gunman, um, but it's going to be all over the news. Yes. And uh, I don't know if we've done anything to sway you one way or another, but hopefully we provided you with right. some food for thought, yeah. some entertainment. Yeah. Absolutely. Look it up. Look it up. Do your yeah. homework. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> don't just take movies just on, on faith. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And check out some of those movies we told you about uh, JFK, Ruby, and Parkland. Parkland. Yes. And uh, we'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. Yes, thank you for listening and watching. We appreciate it.